Welcome, everyone. We are very excited to have you join us today on uh, the panel, Digitally Empowering the Post-COVID Global Economy. And we have a brilliant set of panelists today. We're excited. Um, and we have uh, Johannes, Mike, Dinesh, and Rajiv joining us today. And we'll be covering uh, four different industries, talk about the digital e economy and, and how tech is empowering what could be and should be a better world uh, post the pandemic. So with that, I welcome everyone on the stage. I uh, would love to hear from all of you, a couple of minutes of introductions. Tell us who you are, what you do, um, what your focus is, and... Um, how do you see the digital economy past the pandemic? So maybe, uh, Johannes, if you'd like to start. It's a pleasure. Um, my name is Johannes Heinlein. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer and Senior Vice President for Partnerships at edX. For those of you who don't know what edX is, edX is the global online learning platform founded by Harvard and MIT in 2012. And our goal is to really um, reach the world and to help a groundswell of educational proliferation of technology and to empower people globally. Um, we do that by providing content from leading organizations across the world and by working together with industry, governments, nonprofits and individuals to really facilitate innovation and in digital learning. Um, for us, the future is all about the merging of the digital and the physical. Um, for me and for our organization, even though we're an online learning destination, we're not replacing the physical aspect of education, but rather we're looking for the merging of the digital and the physical. We all have... In the group, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dinesh. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I got a little thrown off there. Uh, we, we, we lost you on us for a second. Uh, but uh, Dinesh, would you like to go next? Tell us about uh, who you are, where you're joining us from, and a little bit about what you're working on. Okay. Thank you, Nabru. Um, I'm, I, I'm based in Singapore right now, so it's about 6.30 in the morning. And um, look, I started a company about four years ago called Smarten Spaces. And the whole intent was that at some point in time, like the e-commerce industry or the fintech industry, the industry of spaces and the places where we spend most of our time will adopt technology, will get disrupted. <clears throat> and I've spent the last four years building a whole bunch of technology that enables us to be able to do that. For the last 12 months, uh, you know, essentially, as you know, there have been so much disruption in how work is going to happen. People have been working at home. It was one of the most successful experiments. But also a lot of people have been going back to work, particularly in some industries, right? And this trend is going to continue through 2021. My bet is that uh, work will move in a more hybrid manner. So it'll be a mix of working from home, working from different locations, and also working in the office. And I think technology has a huge role to play in that because that's what businesses are looking for. So that's really my background. And uh, I've been a techie throughout. I spend time in a lot of companies like AT&T and Cisco and others. And I'm looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, thank you so much, Anais. That's so interesting. I think you kind of, uh, it, it sounds like you agree with what Gwana just said, which is the future is hybrid, combining the physical and digital in ways that is meaningful and um, brings us closer toward human-centered outcomes. And so that's very exciting. And of course, what, you, what you're doing is uh, is upon all of us, uh, which is future work, right? And and I know a lot of tech industries are um, have said to the employees that they can work from home uh, indefinitely. And so a, a lot of things that, that are there to uncover, you know, the, I guess, the impact on the, the macro economy, sort of the, the labor shift between the rural and the urban areas movement, both within the country, uh, but also overseas. And of course, Singapore is probably a fantastic example of a country that's 
handle the pandemic very well. So, so we'll come back to you on, on all of those. There's a lot to unpack there, but I'd love to hear from, from Mike Dury, who's joining us from Germany. There we go, unmuted. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be part of this. Um, um, as Navrat just said, my name is Mike Dury. I'm located in Germany, and um, I wear several different hats. But uh, um, here, I'm. Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about a kind of a boutique advisory. Um, I'm I'm part of um, founding partner, LHD Associates. We um, advise insurance companies. And I think insurance is, um, for a lot of people, it's kind of an abstract business. Um, it's in the purest sense, it's a knowledge based business. So that gives it a lot in common with just about everything that's going on in the business and industrial world these days. The other thing is that insurance interfaces with so many aspects of our day to day lives. The other thing, other thing that makes insurance interesting in this context is that it's a classic example of an industry that has been driving digitalization in the, um, in the intent, excuse me, in the intent to heighten efficiency. So in a way, it, it has left the insurance industry is guilty of leaving the human side out of digitalization to a large extent. And so this is, this is one of the, we just brought out a paper recently, uh, which has uh, uh, also appeared on the Horasis website about this process of digitalization and insurance and how the challenge now is to bring digitalization and human interface together to bring that magic of human interaction into the digital space. So that's that's a, my short introduction of, of uh That's super of, interesting. Of our Thank you, Mike. I think that is a perhaps the most uh perhaps the most, uh, you know, forward thinking uh, take on the insurance uh, sector and insurance industry. So that's very exciting. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'd love to call uh, Rajiv uh, to tell us a little bit about yourself, just a quick introduction. And I'll request all the other speakers to keep yourself on mute, just to avoid any feedback if you're not actively talking. So Rajiv. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the, invitation. I am an activist, economist, and entrepreneur, and I've been working across business, government, and civil society. Uh, for a number of years, I was leading a social movement together with Nelson Mandela and others called the Global Call to Action Against Poverty, and then helped to create something called the B Team, uh, which brought together business leaders, um, CEOs working on the sustainability agenda together with former heads of state and uh, leaders of the trade union movement and other key civil society leaders. And most recently, I've been building on that experience as an executive in residence at Oxford uh, and working together with Cristiana Figueres, um, the architect of the Paris Climate Agreement, to put together an inquiry into the future of climate action, which is being published next month and also building an organization called Bridging Ventures, which um, seeks to bring together business leaders, investors, creatives, investors, uh, artists, um, educators, and governments to help address challenges that we can't address alone to help create a regenerative future. Um, and so I'm looking at uh, the future that we need to now create and the opportunity we have in this critical super year um, in the response to COVID-19 which is decimating our communities uh, in, in building a system uh, and a future which speaks to the challenges of our time uh, and, and the opportunities as we look also to Scotland, my home, which will be hosting a major summit on climate change this year as a critical moment. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Rajiv. That's very, that's very impressive. We definitely want to learn more and cover more on uh, what your take is on uh, with the variety of sectors that you're engaged in when it comes to leveraging tech uh, to do good. And, and that's really kind of at the heart of, uh, heart of this panel. So since we have Johannes back now, Johannes, um, looks like your video is frozen, but if you can hear us, um, 
you know, would love for you to, to chime in and um, uh, perhaps pick up from where we lost you for a second there. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether you can hear me. Um, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And now the video works again. Uh, it, as it happens, I'm so sorry about this. My apologies. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether the last time any of what I said was actually heard. Um, I know the crash was there and I notice um, the picture is really frozen here, which is strange. Uh, very quickly, since you can hear me, um, uh, I'm Johannes Heinlein, the chief uh, commercial officer and SVP for edX, which is the global education platform found by Harvard and MIT. And our mission is to transform not only education, but transform how we as societies engage with education and how we collectively can embrace technology and digital, uh, the digital society to really lead to betterment for everyone um, as an individual and for corporations, government and societies. And I'll keep it short and stop right there. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that that beautifully summarizes uh, a, a lot of what I remember uh, when edX came out. I think I was in high school. Uh, so not not to be <laughs> uh, comparing things here, but I remember me and my brother were so excited. It's like, oh, my God, look at all these Harvard and MIT courses that are, you know, free and open now because you, you don't really have access. And I think. Um, edX really has been a game changer and of course the entire massive open online uh, courses industry uh, that it actually opened up right um, in fact many platforms that uh, went even sort of farther ahead and uh, aggressively tackled um, democratizing education and the access to education as a result of um, edX leadership so um, fantastic fantastic stuff there you honest um, so I'd love to open up the, the conversation to the panel here a little bit and just just kind of get um, your quick take on, uh, you know, we hear a lot about technology helping um, and facilitating the, 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 the common good and the impact goals that uh, many of us are working on directly uh, who are in this panel, uh, but also many of our colleagues. Um, and so I would love to hear from the panelists around what you think is the uh, the correct or the the proper deployment of, of tech, if you may, towards uh, global goals, and and I'm, I'm speaking beyond the SDGs as well, right? As as many of you are looking at tackling industries over and beyond yours, uh, you know that you immediately are focused on whether it's uh, poverty or insurance or or future work or or education. Um, and, and I think what I'm looking for is kind of a nuanced understanding. Uh, we understand technology as, as a tool, uh, but where exactly do you see that, um, you know, potential and promise, but, but in an actionable way that could build a better uh, post-COVID world? So whoever would like to go first, I'll, I'll just invite all the panel. Uh, I won't be shy then. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, I, I think what's really critical is that particular organization or even just one country or uh, society. I think collectively that's the strength of us as a human society to enable a change. And that change is coming whether we're ready for it or not. And I think what we should all embrace is uh, a much greater collaboration. Um, edX, for example, is an open source platform in order to enable all parties across the world to take advantage of educational technologies. Um, and to me, uh, that's one of the key risk areas here, whether we look around where data is being owned, how data is being used, how we engage with each other. So one of the risks and one of the challenges we face is whether we can collectively embrace digital technology for betterment rather than for profit making as a sole primary lead. I'm not against profit making. I'm just saying digital requires more than just profits. Absolutely. And I think that's probably what we've seen over the past years where tech that was supposed to be 
for good ubiquitously has ended up becoming what's called a, a platform, right? Most of the people access the World Wide Web through a handful of platforms. Uh, and that was not the original vision for, for the World Wide Web. So uh, thank you, Anas. I think you touched upon a, a very important point. I'd love to hear from the other panelists what their take is on uh, on, on the potential and the, and the, and the, and I think the proper use of tech. Hmm. So, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, I, I just, uh, I, I found that really interesting what you're saying, Johannes, that's very inspiring. Um, and of course, um, edX, I mean, it's, it's an organization that, that as Navrup, uh, rightly said, really is a game changer and, and can really, uh, Open up a level of inclusivity uh, on a worldwide scale that's that's uh, that's unprecedented. Um, it, returning to the insurance industry, though, and in this paper I mentioned, we talk about the restaurant chain Cheesecake Factory, and I'm not sure um, who's familiar with it in the, in the U U.S. It's pretty well known. Um, Great. And <laughs> it's actually it, it's 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 a it's a high end restaurant chain. It's not they don't just sell cheesecake, right? So you can you know have any any kind of food you want there, um, and it's uh, very close to Michelin star level, but at moderate prices. And that restaurant chain does this with the benefit of artificial intelligence and all kinds of digital tools. And has actually managed um, in the restaurant industry in the U.S. It's not unusual for restaurants to throw away as much as 10% of their food stocks before they ever reach the customer. Which, considering that um, the uh, the food, the, the the raw material makes about uh, makes up about 25% of the cost. That's a huge, it's not only unsustainable, it's not, not only hugely wasteful, it's financially um, suicidal. And uh, Cheesecake Factory has cut that way down to, I think, just over 2%. So this is the interesting thing. The restaurant customer experiences high-quality service, excellent-quality food, and all of this digital technology takes place behind the scenes. So in the truest sense, it's being used to create a better human experience. And if you apply this to insurance, you get, for example, usage-based insurance, where various activities um, can be insured on an, on an on-demand basis. So the customer can go in with a smartphone and insure something an activity of uh, some work he or she is doing, whatever, you know, it can be a liability cover, any of this kind of thing. So again, this is where digitalization is making insurance more inclusive. So yeah, that's my two cents <laughs> to yeah, kind of tie in. My, with, uh, yeah, I think I think what you talked about, if I if I follow correctly, is that there is um there is tech that could be used for not just, you know, front facing, uh, you know, experience, but also at the back end, uh, right, optimizing processes. And I think uh, this is actually a great segue into supply chains where, uh, you know, a lot of usage and uh, off different products and efficiencies that uh, actually giants like Amazon have been able to achieve is very much to the use of tech. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from Rajiv and, and, and Dinesh further on, uh, you know, on the topic and, and whoever would like to chime in, I'd love to hear from the other panelists. Sure. Hey, thanks, Navru. So talking about inclusive, right? I actually believe that the future of work will make uh, so many other people very, very inclusive into the workplace. I, I've, I've seen hiring that used to be very localized to where your main office location was, but now people are hiring from anywhere. You know, you have the ability to bring talent in, um, you know, for sure. In some large countries, uh, there are many cities. They're called tier one, tier two, tier three cities. And the ability to just go out and hire from anywhere based on the skill uh, has been huge. I think it's going to be one of the bigger benefits of the hybrid workplace. Um, you know, also, I feel in general in a hybrid workplace, I mean, we all have been running back to the office offices and CBDs have been overcrowded. There's been a lot of commute that's been happening. 
I think hybrid will have a huge impact on sustainability. Hybrid will have a huge impact on, you know, you talked about wasted food, I think, or wasted space. I think before the pandemic, you know, we would have uh, at least our statistics showed 100% of the space was only used 50% of the time um, because half the office was always empty. People were traveling, etc. I think in the post pandemic world, uh, leveraging on technology, you know, you'll probably only have 70% of the space, but you'll use it 100% of the time, right? So multiple impacts that the future of work or hybrid working is going to create. And in one sense, it is meant for businesses to benefit. However, the offshoot will be that society at large, uh, it'll make it more inclusive, much more sustainable, and there'll be less wastage. Right. So I think what I'm hearing here is that we have to, we have to come back better and, and stronger. And the pandemic is, is kind of a catalyst, uh, you know, uh, from, from the general sentiment here, uh, towards that better, more included and inclusive uh, world, if you may. So what, what do you think, Rajiv? I, I know you're involved in a bunch of excellent initiatives. Um, uh, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, the, using tech and leveraging tech for uh, a post-pandemic. Uh, well, I think we have to be very um, sober about the state of the world in the current moment. Um, and, you know, I just came back from a small island developing state in Jamaica and sat with fishermen whose livelihoods are being decimated and they're trying to um, to ensure there's enough food. Uh, at the same time, the fish stocks are declining, the ecosystems, many of the world's ecosystems, 80% are in fact in decline. Um, inequality, and I know the framing of the session was really looking at this question around the economic system and how do we ensure that the wealth um, is 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 also um, reaching those at the base of the pyramid? And you know we do have a system where um, the marginal propensity to consume we know as economists of those with the lower income is always going to be higher than those with a higher income. Um, and so for the economy to grow, um, we need we need a, a smaller um, Gini co coefficient, and that's something which you know, Thomas Piketty and others have picked up. Um, so I think inequality is definitely something we really need to think about as we as we build back from COVID. Um, and every civilization that has collapsed before us has has collapsed because its environment has shifted faster than it was able to shift its culture. And when I think about technology and the impact it has today on attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, um, I really start to think about the role of technology, particularly on in Silicon Valley in the West Coast, the increasing you know, role of platforms in in affecting mindset shift, um, and that's one of the key pieces of uh, of thinking that is coming out of, of the inquiry. We've been looking at you know applying the, the lens of cognitive science to questions around mindset shift, and I think there's a role to play um, for technology companies um, who are increasingly investing and engaging in the production of content to think about responsible content and positive content, content which helps humanity um, to shepherd and steward um, a future which reflects the values that we need to employ in order to create the kind of world that we want and one that, um, that we can pass on to future generations. Um, I also would say that it's important to consider um, I remember writing a book review once of um, a book by Kevin Keeley, the founder of Wired magazine, uh, uh, a book that he'd written called What Technology Wants, where he writes about the, um, the the fact that technology has patterns. It has, you know, almost like we see in nature. We see that, you know, whether it's Moore's Law or whether it's the the semiconductor, um, uh, the, the fact that semiconductor uh, use can kind of increases in a similar pattern or whether the carrying capacity of a drone is increasing on an 18-month cycle, um, both in pace and, and, and capacity. Um, and what we start to see is that what technology wants kind of follows a pattern, but that pattern doesn't necessarily line up with what humanity needs. And I think that's where perhaps one of the things we need to think about is the role of policy. Um, and a lot of investment, I think, is, is going in, even from, from those who are at the forefront of technology, like Elon Musk and others, in really thinking about how do we ensure that um, that some of these big questions around artificial intelligence um, benefit from uh, a deep policy response in thinking about 
how we nurture these technologies in a way that supports humanity to flourish, but also protects us from the potential risks of these technologies. And so I think we're at a really critical moment in time where these technologies have the potential to create a lot of positive impact. Um, but we also have to look at it through the lens of those um, operating in, in some of the countries where technology um, isn't yet reaching people and where the, the opportunity to engage in, 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 in jobs which will provide a much higher level of income mean that we need to create investments in coding and a whole a host of other services in those countries. So um, I think there's a huge opportunity ahead of us, um, but we need to be really thoughtful about it um, and really understand the interconnectedness of this agenda. Yeah, thank you, Rajiv. I think you've brought uh, a bunch of absolutely excellent and critical topics and points here around policy. And, and I would say even more broadly, governance, because that would include self-governance as well. You know, it's very hard to regulate a, a multinational because it operates across geographies. So we often talk about uh, kind of governance and obviously policy being a, a subsect of it. Um, and I think the increasing pressure on on on, on corporates for, for uh, you know, self-governance, not just within the firm, but also uh, with each other. And we, we've seen uh, during uh, during the pandemic, and, and it's still going on, right, uh, that there is a, a marked shift in uh, the messaging, if you may, that's coming out from, from the corporates. And many of us who uh, work closely with them um, kind of see that, that, you know, uh, the pandemic is a crisis, is obviously not just a health crisis, uh, last year, we wrote a piece in, in Forbes around the quadruple crisis, uh, the climate, the economic, the social, um, and the health crisis, right? And, and how these are sort of interrelated and uh, kind of leading up to a, a lot of the critical questions which, you know, have been sort of being discussed. And at World Economic Forum, for example, where Frank and I met, uh, was a chairperson of Parasis, um but also in, in many other circles. Uh, I would actually love to turn this around to the other panelists. Tell us uh, what you're seeing, right, from, from a governance policy and, uh, and uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, a responsible uh, text, just to kind of, you know, uh, see some tangible examples uh, of that. And what is it that you see in, in your industry, in your space, that needs to happen? Um, you know, and, uh, again, I think uh, I'd love to learn more and, and further in terms of uh, what those actionable items are and, and not just blue sky thinking, right? Because I think the time is running out on us. Uh. Yeah, I, I, if, if I may, I think one of the aspects we underestimate as, as much as the challenges and, and we can be and should be concerned, technology has also enabled us to, oh, particularly over the last 12 months, to find solutions to problems that even 10, 15 years would have been unimaginable whether that's the accelerated development of vaccines, the distribution of vaccine, the access that many learners, yes, there is a divide still, but that many students across the world have through technology to learning materials. Um, we're complaining about what the pandemic has done to us today, but without technology, I think the outcomes would have been even more negative, quite frankly. So I would like us, you know, we're talking about digitally empowering, empowering the post COVID economy, really be thoughtful around what worked and what didn't work. Um, I think there are many positive aspects, again, in my industry, education, there are many positive aspects of how we can engage, but we've also learned what didn't work. Um, and that's where we need to bring together policymakers, industry, particularly with its large finances, investing into the technology to do better, quite frankly. I think um, that's often my biggest concern at the end of this crisis. Are we going to be able to look back and learn the lessons, the hard lessons, and make the shift that needs to occur? Or are we just going to assume, ah, all is well, move on, now we have the vaccine? So I think that's the challenge for us. To me, if we apply solutions thoughtfully, if we collaborate, there is actually a brighter future. So I like to be an optimist in this instance, even at these difficult times. No, I think you hit the you hit the right word. You have to be optimistic, but also as we think of the future, it would be um, you know really great if we don't go back to every mistake we were making before the pandemic. And I think I I kind of always talk about work because I think it has a huge impact. Jobs have a huge impact. And look, right now what I've seen is a lot of 
countries have put in laws, regulations about what percentages can go back. You know, there has to be social distancing, which obviously creates the imperative that you can't overcrowd and things like that. Now, I'm not saying that we want to continue with that post, uh, you know, basically the pandemic. But I think some regulation or some thinking of that sort at a government level, at a country level would be a good thing because, you know, you don't want to go back to where we were. Right. And it had its own challenges in terms of, you know, like I mentioned, you have to be living in that place. And, you know, there was definitely a lot of crowding, base stage, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And then it also created. See, today we are all equal. Right. There's no round table here and I'm sitting at the head of the table or Rajiv is sitting at the head of the table. We're all equal. We have engagement going on. And if the world in some form or shape can continue uh, down that manner, I think that's when we will successfully embrace on what I like to believe is the future of work. And technology is an equalizer. We all have Internet, so we're all equal. You know, you have the ability to deliver education to any part of the world so that it equally gets distributed. Um, and the same thing has to be adopted at the future of work. So that's where my bet would be or my ask would be from a government perspective also. Yeah, I think there's there's more that needs to go in. Dinesh, I, I, uh, and I think Rajiv can probably build on this more, but um, the, the intent is good, but high-speed internet is not something the whole world has access to. Or, or the context, right, in, in which, because learning is tacit, uh, you know, it's the environment that you operate in. And that's why the retention rate of, uh, for example, massive open online courses is, is very small. Uh, edX is great, you honest, so, so <laughs> we, we like edX. Uh, but I remember when the first report came out, it's around 6% when it comes to the completion rate. Uh, now compare that to a traditional university or a school, you know, we're looking at much higher 90, 95% numbers. And that's because those other things need to exist in the environment for, for learning to take place. And I think that's kind of where, and kind of what I was referring to, that what are those things, you know, um, that we need to ensure. And, and I think that's really kind of what kind of starts to get us into what Rajiv mentioned as the regenerative, um, you know, economy and, and, and world. Uh, Rajiv, if you want to build a little bit more on that, I guess uh, I would I, I would hand over the baton to you as a, as a fellow economist. And I'm sure you. You know, I, I would say that I think we're moving into a non-binary world, you know, where, where we really are thinking at a non-quantum in a quantum fashion where I mean, it is both. And it is there are there, there are things that we can learn from how we were organizing our society before COVID that we need to continue to build on. And there are things that we learned during COVID the way we had to organize differently that we also need to, to take with us as we move forward. And there will be other things and which we have to build upon as we think uh, about the road ahead. And, you know, I was speaking, for example, just before this call to a, a colleague at Columbia University and she was speaking a, with passion about how, you know, the partnership with WeWork and 70 WeWork offices around the world where students were able to use WeWorks with properly social distancing gave access to some people who were in education but didn't actually have a safe environment in which to work and didn't really have a safe environment in which to work before COVID and has, has given them a lot more intelligence and understanding around what does what is the digital component of learning need to look like for it to really function well which which they don't want to lose when campuses come back and um and there's some you know really rich learning in that but at the same time i think um you you sp i speak to interns and, and, and students who are, who are working um with me and they're they're enjoying this balance of being able to participate more in part-time work at the same time as doing their studies because they're getting incomes and they're also working with in the field uh, to try and make ends meet during COVID-19. And actually they're, they're finding that this is a way of being that they actually also value. Um, so I think what we need is like a way of capturing a lot of this learning and thinking differently about how we organize as to your point, Dinesh, I think the future of work is emerging um, and it's happening. Um, and and it's, it's not something that we'll, we'll, we'll just see it. it it's, it's actually already happening around us. And so um, how do we highlight the positive examples um, orchestrate and help scale up um, 
the, the, those that are working and you know operationalize some of what needs to happen next. Fantastic. And and Mike, I know you've written a number of papers when it comes to uh, human centered uh, digital economy of the future on the role of gender equality, which is trillions of dollars of waste potential on the role of inclusion. Um, and uh, I remember this one paper, which is on the fragility of digital tech uh, that we take for granted, or we have been, I should say, taking for granted um, the stability that we enjoyed um, when it comes to digital tech uh, uh, because of the relative peace in quote unquote, the, the Western hemisphere uh, of the world. And, and now that we have a series of cascading natural disasters that are only gonna intensify due to climate change, you know, that stability that we've been taking for granted over the past 50 years or so, it's probably not going to remain. And, and we see that, right? Hawaii currently where I'm speaking from is in a state of emergency due to flooding. Uh, I know uh, the, the East Coast has been badly hit. There were tornadoes in Mississippi yesterday. California was on fire. Texas had its an entire electricity grid, um, you know, down. And, and the list goes on. And that's just the U.S. And, and I apologize, the examples were all focused on the U.S., but I'm just trying to, uh, make sure to be true to that, that uh, you know, that the summit, which is focused on, on the United States and, and, of course, with the new administration, a lot of things are expected to change. And I'd love to go into that in a second. But, but Mike, over to you. What are some of your learnings of the past year? for the Chief Risk Officers Forum um, in, I believe, 2007 about pandemic risk. It's, it's all been out there. This has, shouldn't have come as any kind of surprise to, to any authorities. Uh, and um, you mentioned climate change and extreme weather events. These are areas where the insurance industry because of its risk expertise, can play a very important advisory role uh, in terms of policy making. And of course, um, again, returning to the topic of um, of inclusivity, um, if you look at health risk, health risk is the number one cause that forces people into poverty worldwide. So um, there's the counterpart to uh, microfinancing is microinsurance. And the insurance industry um, is, is already, to some extent, uh, I, I believe the industry can do a great deal more, um, providing risk transfer solutions that prevent these worst case scenarios from taking place. Also, mm -hmm. another very important topic is crop insurance. As these extreme weather events increase, um, the poorest countries uh, and agrarian driven countries are going to see uh, higher and higher risks. And here again, um, crop insurance in, say, Africa, there are crop insurance solutions available that a farmer can buy via smartphone and uh, cover, have a cover for just, you know, whatever period it takes before the crops are harvested. So these, these are all areas where, let's say, the financial services industry in general, and specifically insurance companies, can do a great deal to, to buffer the, um, the, these risks and how they are going to affect the poorest of the poor. I have a question here, Mike. I know you talked about sort of um, insurance industry sort of stepping in to a lot of these challenges, obviously for disruption uh, themselves because of the changing world, but what they can do to facilitate a better world. Um, my question here, this is kind of something I was reading previously on the insurance industry, um, actually a book by Michael Lewis called The Fifth Risk on the Disasters under the last administration. Fantastic book. I highly recommend Um and the things that I learned was the portfolio for risks that governments run, that insurance is not, insurance as a, as a sector is not ready to take up. 
Classic example, natural disasters, billions of dollars, even if it's a relatively small natural disaster. So I think my question for you, Mike, is, is the sector ready? Would it be ready to take on the challenges of what the, the uncertain, highly volatile world are we going to be living in in the future? We already are in it, you know. So what's your reading of, of this space, right? Well, let's put it this way. Um, if you look at risks that insurance companies, even the big reinsurance companies, won't touch, it tells you a lot about those risks. Let's just say um, the tsunami and the meltdown in Fukushima. The the actual tsunami was what what's termed, I believe, a millennial risk, something that it can be expected to occur every thousand years on average. So um, a lot of the damage was actually covered by insurance companies and reinsurance companies. The meltdown of the of, of the of the nuclear facility is not insurable. So, you know, I, I, I think that tells you a lot about what kind of a risk that is. There's some levels of risk where there has to be a public-private partnership to uh, manage the risk. That's simply reality. Terrorism, for example, um, where you have a malicious perpetrator um, behind actions. On the other hand, as I mentioned, I think the insurance industries, uh, the insurance and reinsurance companies can do a great deal in the advisory space. And I think it's telling that, say, a company like uh, Munich Re, the world's largest reinsurance company, has been one of the very first corporates to start talking about climate change. And the former CEO was a regular speaker at every climate conference. So, mm. you know, um, mm. I think, I, I think this is where the, the corporates and, and the governments Uh, close to an end, uh, but this certainly has to continue. Um, I would love to invite the other panelists here to see if they have any last comments. We have around four minutes more, three minutes more into into the panel, uh, and just what would be a closing remarks or any one message you'd like to leave our audience with today. Just building on that last comment, I think we're in a moment where policy and markets and even the, mon the money system needs to work together. And we've really got to get that right. And if we go, don't get that right, the economic system isn't going to support the kind of transformation that we need. Um, I remember when we were setting up coalitions on the road through Paris and Tim Cook came to New York and said, you know, it's time for companies to compete, I'm sorry, to cooperate on the sustainability agenda and calling for green and clean and green R&D. You know, and, and I think shifting the paradigm from compete and consume towards cooperate to conserve is partly what we, we're really looking at here, that the civilization, we need to start shifting how we, we come up with these solutions. And the digital companies, I think, can really help lead the way um, in sharing, at least on, on, the, on the clean and green agenda, some of these solutions that can scale up, particularly in countries where, where they're most needed and, and where we need to leapfrog many of the technologies that are being locked in right now if we look at the bailouts and the COVID recovery packages. Right, right, thank you. And so, anything you know, else you'd like to add, Johannes? Sorry, no, just some last thoughts, right? I think that the pandemic had a lot of, it created a lot of disruptions in the industries, uh, basically across the board. I think it's time for companies and for governments to kind of embrace and understand that those are long-term disruptions. It's not as if, oh, first of June, everything's gonna be great and I'm going back. Um, I think it's time to understand that. It's time to be bold about embracing them. And I think technology has a huge role to play in this decade for us to be able to navigate through the situations. Um, and, um, you know, it sort of comes down to the boldness to be able to accept it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, Giannis, any last parting?
very quickly, I believe, strongly believe that educated people, generally speaking, make better choices. So it's important that we bring education from K to 12. So starting at the youngest through lifelong learning um, uh, into society as a, as a good rather than as a privilege. Um, and that's one of our challenges. I think we need to collaborate across education around society's challenges around industries to really transform how we use technology going forward. Well said. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful set of insights. And with that, uh, we are actually at time. So uh, I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time today to all the panelists and all the attendees who are joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, the talk would be available later for viewing.